Good evening. I've been lucky over the past decade to travel around the world competing in ultra-distance runs that often involve covering the distance of two or more marathons at once, in endurance mountain biking events that involve more climbing than an ascent of Mount Everest, and in adventure races that involve running, mountain biking, paddling, fixed ropes, horseback riding, camels, just about anything else you can think of. Uh, during that time, I've utilized six rules that continually help me maintain my drive to train and compete at a very high level. My goal is that these rules and the stories that accompany them will have some degree of relevance to you and your pursuit of drive in whatever it is that happens to be important to you. Rule number one, the 4.30 a.m. rule. This has to do with making the choice to give up choice. If you're like me when your alarm goes off at 4.30 in the morning uh, because it's time to get out and do some training or do a race or grade some papers or whatever the case might be, you probably don't feel like waking up. You probably feel like hitting that snooze button. But if you're following this rule, if you've made the choice ahead of time to give up that choice, things become a lot easier, and you don't have to worry about it in the moment. That, that little switch in your thinking can make a huge difference in tackling anything challenging in your life. When my alarm went off at 4.30 in the morning in uh, December of 2009 in my tent out in the middle of nowhere in Abu Dhabi, uh, this is what was waiting for me. Uh, it was about 120 kilometers of trekking across an area called the Rub al Khali. It's uh, the empty quarter, the largest expanse of unbroken sand dunes in the world. And my four-person uh, four uh, co-ed team of four would be uh, racing across this against uh, the best adventure racing teams out there. When the alarm went off, uh, we had two choices. We could get up and, uh, and head out into this, or we could sleep for a few more hours, get on a bus, drive back to Abu Dhabi, and hang out in a five-star hotel, do some indoor skiing uh, for the next few days, um, which sounded kind of good. And I tell you what, some teams uh, took up that option. We, um, we were hurting. This is what we had done for the previous uh, two days. We'd been paddling uh, around the, the coastline of the United Arab Emirates, uh, about 80 miles uh, a day for a couple days, and, and we, we were crushed. Like I said, this was uh, December, and if you can imagine December in Colorado, there's not a lot of liquid water around to prepare yourself for paddling. So we tried to get ready, but uh, things, uh, things didn't come off too well. So thankfully, we had made, ahead of time, we had made the choice to give up choice, and, um, and, and not doing it wasn't an option and that made it that much easier. It was, it was still challenging, of course, but we were able to crank on through, and we ended up, uh, we ended up winning the stage out there. Uh, I also think on this note of, uh, of my dad, who's in the audience here today. Um, I've been able to watch my dad do a lot of really neat things in uh, ultra running and adventure racing, and he's, he's won races, and he's still out there doing it. Uh, but the, the point, I think, that sticks with me the most, when I think back, uh, was, was kind of this, uh, this stage here um, in the early 90s, the first time my dad did the Leadville 100 uh, when he finished dead last. He uh, literally came in a couple minutes before the cutoff, um, running on fumes, towing his torn hamstrings behind him, and uh, even, even as a little boy, uh, I, I, I still remember that, and, and just the idea that he had made the choice ahead of time to give up choice, and, and quitting wasn't an option, and that, uh, that made all the difference. I think it'll make all the difference in life as well. I think sometimes uh, the idea of, of ego gets a bad rap. And when I say this, I'm not talking about uh, the way that you treat people or uh, conducting yourself in, in any way that's anything but humble, but I do believe if you want to do something that's big and 
challenging and important, having a high view of yourself is absolutely crucial. I think on this point, about uh, 2005, uh, I had literally just graduated college. I didn't have any uh, long racing experience. And on paper, there was no reason that I should be racing with this team composed of three of the best adventure racers in the world in a big race in Sweden uh, against all the, the best teams uh, from around the globe. There was really, I, I had no business being there other than the fact that I believed that I could do it. Uh, this is day five of the race. Uh, you can see the, the image is a little bit hazy. I chose this one because my, my view of the world by that time was, was pretty hazy, uh, at least during the times when I wasn't hallucinating uh, from sleep deprivation. But uh, four days earlier, on, on the first day of the race, we had already tipped over the kayak in a big river that was lined with ice on the side and somehow got it going again. Uh, we had pulled our boats across uh, this 10-mile-long frozen lake that periodically wasn't frozen enough, so you'd be walking along and fall through the ice and kind of get woken up, get out again, walk along, fall through the ice again. Uh, we had broken into a cabin in the middle of the night because we we're afraid uh, that, that we weren't going to make it through if, if we didn't make it. Um, we had drug our, our bikes through this, this uh, frozen swamp kind of area and then had to pee on them to, to get them to, to work again. And um, it was, uh, like I said, it was, it was, it was quite an experience. And really, the, in a situation like that, and that's like many things in, your, in life, when it just it, it becomes a haul and, and, and a drag. The only reason we made it through was, was because uh, we had that ego. As important as it is to have an ego, it's just as important to take that ego and throw it out the window and ask for help. Um, this is something that I try to do very often in my life. It's something that comes up very commonly uh, in, in the world of endurance racing. Uh, the guy on the left here is my buddy, John Brown. He lives in Gunnison, Colorado, kind of a modern-day mountain man. Uh, John and I have been all around the world together doing these kind of races. Uh, I think of one particular racing experience. Uh, we were in the Alps in France in 2008, and uh, I had Giardia that I had gotten in a, in a previous race. And if you can imagine Giardia, imagine what I've told you about adventure racing, uh, the two do not go well together by any means. And everything that, that you can imagine was, was pretty much happening. Um, thankfully, uh, we, we, we took a retractable dog leash and uh, zip-tied it to the back of John's bike seat post and put a little bungee cord on it so that I could hold on to it kind of as I, as I drug along. And, and he, he towed me up and down the Alps for, for five days, and, and that's how uh, we made it through the race. Um, since then and, and prior to then, I've been able to do the, the same thing for John in, in different times. Doing something like that and admitting that you, you may be a strong athlete, but, but you, you really need help, um, that takes throwing at your ego out the window, and it's absolutely important, particularly, I would say, in a team environment. It's uh, very, very important to do. One other story on that note, uh, this guy is Josiah Mido. He lives in Vail, Colorado. He's one of the best Xterra athletes in the world. And for years, he's also been my arch nemesis in competition. We, we go head to head a lot, and uh, he beats me almost every time. I've, I've had a lot, a lot of second place finishes to Josiah. And uh, a few months ago, I, I finally decided, well, if you can't beat him, join him. I, I came to Josiah and I said, hey, do you want to be my coach? Do you want to help me uh, kind of streamline my training, be a little bit more scientific about things? And he said, yeah, and I've signed him up and it's, it's been a great system. He's been, uh, been really helpful and, um, and uh, th things are going well for me. And that, that took it to some way saying, okay, well, hey, this guy probably knows more than I do. I had to throw my ego out the window there. Motivators. I think that uh, it's important to have both kinds of motivation. I'd say intrinsic motivation in my book, that's, that's almost a given. I'd say if you're not doing something that you're not intrinsically motivated to do, then you should probably be doing something else. If you are doing something that you're intrinsically motivated to do, then take those extrinsic motivators because if you're doing something that's important and challenging, you're going to need all the motivation that you can possibly get. So take those extrinsic 
motivators. My example here is uh, some races in China. My team and I have been going to these recently, and I'll tell you, the first reason uh, that we go is, is because of money. There's good prize money there. But here's the thing. What starts with an extrinsically motivated experience becomes intrinsically motivated, and, and the two begin to play off each other. So we get to China, and we're running past these traditional villages and getting to see a way of life uh, that, that we never get to see. We're, we're going through these places where the media is all over, and you feel like you're some kind of superstar or something. Uh, biking through rice paddies in, in kind of traditional places, seeing little kids are out there. They're giving you high fives. They're yelling, Jayo, Jayo, Jayo. Those kind of things, it's... it's uh, yeah, like I said, it, it fuels your fire, and something that started out with a primarily extrinsic component becomes intrinsic, and the two continue uh, to build. You see the, the traditional marketplaces, seeing amazing uh, spots in China like this rappel into a huge canyon. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty cool thing to do. I truly believe that the stories that we tell ourselves uh, first of all, most of them are just that, stories. And second of all, they're, they're very, uh, very important. Uh, a few days ago, on Saturday, I was in Zion National Park. Uh, my goal on this trip was to break the record for the Trans-Zion Run, basically a run from one side of the park to the other. This is a 48-mile route. Uh, a guy had done it last year in 7 hours and 48 minutes, and my goal was to uh, break this time. It was kind of like my, my own race out there all along. And it, was a, it was a pretty neat thing uh, to do. We, uh, there's challenging terrain, challenging conditions. Um, this picture here, this is a descent into an area called the Grotto. And it kind of speaks to my, uh, my English, my inner English teacher. This, uh, it it kind of looks like Dante's path down into hell uh, in the inferno, and, and, and it, it was appropriate because this is a run. I, I was fighting demons, really leading up to the run, and at times uh, on the run, I was battling a negative story. And the negative story went something like this. Uh, a couple months ago, our second child was born. Uh, we have two little kids in diapers, and the story that was in my mind was, all right, you've got two little kids, you've got a full-time job, how in the world can you still be a world-class athlete? How is it going to happen? How is it going to fit in? And this is something, like I said, at times it was, it was dragging, me, dragging me down. It was, it was a negative story. It was a demon. And I finally got to the, to the point where I said, I need, to, I need to rewrite this story. I need to have uh, something new in my mind. And, and I did that. I said, okay, I can still do this. I signed up Josiah as my coach to uh, help me be more efficient with the limited training time that I have. And it, things worked out. I was, I was able to get out there and, and set the record, and I, um, I, I kind of crushed it. I was, um, I was pretty happy with it. And, and, and the record, though, that was, it was, it was secondary. It was the, the going out and, and showing myself that, that, that I could do this, that this can still be a part of my life. For me, having that story, that was the most meaningful piece of it all. These five rules that I mentioned, they're, they're fairly uh, self-centered. Uh, my, my final point here, if you really want to be motivated, if you really want drive, my advice, and I think this is probably the most important one, is to combine whatever it is that you're doing with helping someone in some way. Uh, here's a, a shot of uh, Ryan Haby summoning Bergen Peak. That was uh, me and Ryan and Jackson Saylor, another EHS student. Uh, we did this uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, last summer, Ryan had finished uh, his, his year at Western State Colorado College where he won two running national championships. He had just run in the Olympic trials in the steeplechase, and he experienced a traumatic brain injury. Uh, this injury was, it, it was challenging. It was challenging, obviously, for Ryan and, and his family. It was challenging for our entire community. And, and it was unknown for a while whether Ryan would, would make it through and what the outcomes uh, would be. Months later, um, Ryan is, I, I'm proud to say, he's, he's, he's doing very well. I have been able, over this spring, to uh, run with Ryan a few days every single week. The irony here is, is that the, the idea, the original idea, is I'm supposed to go out there and help Ryan, help him get back into shape to rejoin the Western State team. 
when in fact, these runs are, are doing more for me, I, th- I think, than they're doing for him. My, with my drive, with my motivation, with uh, putting things in perspective about life in general. It's been very helpful. So let me leave you with this. If you can keep these points in mind, the 4.30 a.m. rule, having an ego, throwing that ego out the window, intrinsic and extrinsic motivators, fighting your demons with better stories and helping someone, I think if you can do those things, it will be true what Ken Kluber, the race director at the Leadville 100 run, says every year on the starting line, you're better than you think you are, you can do more than you think you can. Thank you.